Welcome to the Business and Brews podcast, where our mission is to highlight local businesses in the Triangle area and shed light on different industries. Welcome back to the Business and Brews show. I'm Gavin Vincent. I am Ryan Smelton. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight I am very excited because you already saw a little preview of what's about to go down. Uh, Matthew and Natalie are dog trainers and brand developers. Mm -hmm. So uh, Matthew, Natalie, tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. Yeah, so my name is Matt Hubble. I've lived here in the Raleigh area for, gosh, probably 16 years now. Went to started going to middle school here, and I've been here ever since. Um, my background is pretty interesting. You know, I started out in entrepreneurship the ripe age of 17, 18, was big on social media, big into working out and uh, was just really active on the forums. So back, you know, back in 2009, 2010, Instagram, all these platforms were still kind of like just becoming adapted. It, it, girls and boys were just starting to use Instagram. It wasn't just girls anymore that were using it. <laughs> and so uh, I was really into fitness at this time. And so I started posting workout videos and just really tracking my progress. And, you know, as a 17, 18 year old kid seeing results for the first time. And through that, through posting on these forums and becoming a moderator and just really starting to participate in these online communities, um, I had some cool opportunities. And one of them was being a teen amateur of the year on bodybuilding.com. Hmm. And unbeknownst to myself, that me applying to that little you know award on bodybuilding.com landed me on the front page. Uh, ended up wow. winning the award wow. and you know overnight, essentially, had thousands of people now come to my Facebook page saying, hey, Matt, <laughs> saw your article. Do you think you could write me a workout program? Can you can you train me? And when you're 17, 18, you're you're concerned with school and these other things, you're like, sure, yeah. PayPal me, you know, like what do you get? 50 bucks, you know? Yeah. And you know, one client turned into three, turned into 20, turned into, you know, a few hundred after a wow. while, and mm. suddenly I was exposed to what was really possible online. Wow. And so from then, yeah, I tried going to school, trying still doing this fitness stuff amounts at time, but um, eventually found my way to a, a camera and started recording all my workouts mm. and posting on YouTube and mm. this and that. And long story short, you know, caught the bug for really building online brands and working with different people, worked with myself. And over the past probably seven or eight years now, I've been, you know, had the great opportunity to work with a lot of different people from your celebrity CEOs that you see online to talent at Disney and Marvel and all the way down to local businesses here in the area. And in other countries so it's i've been able to work and get my hands on a lot of different businesses and a lot of different industries and um all of that's you know lately now culminated into canine performance which is nice. the dog training mm -hmm. business that natalie and i started back in june of 2019 and uh, it's been a really exciting journey because we've I've been able to take this culmination of skills that i've developed over the past you know almost a decade now and apply it into what we're doing now. And so that's kind of my story in a, in a nutshell. Let Natalie kind of jump in and share a little bit about herself. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So I was originally born and raised in North Idaho, um, mm. if you know where that is, not Iowa. Um, <laughs> so grew up there uh, and then moved to here in North Carolina, actually in Chapel Hill, mm. uh, right after college. Uh, did an internship. <laughs> did that for four years. And so after I graduated, they're like, hey, you did a really great job. Why don't you move to North Carolina? So here I am. Uh, and I got my start in the world in business marketing and advertising uh, and a lot of sales, hmm. um, but got kind of tired of the corporate world a little yeah. bit. And it was funny how I got into dog training because for canine performance, I'm the dog trainer. I'm, I'm the one that like does the hands-on stuff. <laughs> um, but we have two dogs. We have a Siberian Husky Aurora and then a German Shepherd Husky named Atlas. Mm -hmm. And before they were trained, um, Atlas had actually ran off and he got lost in the woods overnight. Um, and so after that, it was kind of like an eye-opening thing of like, we should really get our dogs trained. Mm -hmm. um, so... Matt had a friend that went to this really prestigious dog training school, and he actually trained our dogs first. But then after that, um, you know, kind of you have to upkeep with dog training. There's like a, you have to keep on doing it throughout yeah. the dog's life. So I started to dive more into that, hmm. um, and I got just really hooked. It was just something that was like super fun, and yeah. I was like, wow, this is just 
a really great thing to do. So I just started learning more and more about it, um, kind of understudied under him. He wasn't quite ready to take on a lot more people. I ended up working at um, a really big facility here in the area, um, did that for um, quite a while and continued kind of like training dogs like on my own and everything. Um, but yeah, Canon Performance kind of came to be kind of like Matt said, it was... Yeah, yeah well, I was... <clears throat> I was doing agency life, so you yep. know, doing a lot of work for other clients. Mm -hmm. And you yep. know, for anyone out there that's ever done an, had an agency or done a lot of client work, it can be exhausting. You know, yep. trying to juggle different projects and in different industries with different types of people. You know, so uh, we had a business part, a third business partner in the agency at one point, and he stepped out to go do his own thing, and it kind of left Natalie and I in this place where we're like, well what do we, you know, what, what should we do? You know, are we going to continue to do this agency work and travel and deal with the dogs and all that yeah. stuff? Or is there a way where we can fuse our whole lifestyle into this one thing that we can kind of drill down and focus on? That's awesome. And uh, it ended up being canine performance. And what I was telling Gavin before we you know started going live is that it was kind of a spur of the moment thing. I, you know, as all that was happening, I was like, let me pull up the camera and just do some vlogs. Yeah. Let, me, let me find my roots and go back to vlogging. And through that, I needed like a topic. You know, you, yeah, you guys yeah. create content. It's like, oh, what's the next topic, right? Yeah. And so I was like, well, let me see if I can show people what it would take to just start a brand overnight. And so nice. we took the idea of like, all right, we'll start this dog training business. We pull the camera, shot a little <laughs> clip. I threw a landing page together and I made the YouTube video. It's actually out there. Yeah. I'll have to send to you guys. But yeah, I after that, hours. yeah, so after that, um, you know, we actually started generating of business and we said hey let's just lean into this you know yeah. we actually feel pretty good about it you know because we'd we'd had so much practice as a couple working together for mm -hmm. you know upwards of four years you know for us to start creating content and do all the things that you know all the check all the boxes when it comes mm -hmm. to building your online brand you know it felt seamless to us so we started leaning into that and here we are, you know, eight, nine months later, we've got a pretty substantial Instagram following, you know, we've done a good job of doing some influencer collaborations and building some momentum uh, inside of the dog training community. And uh, yeah, we're really excited about what the future holds for it because as we've gotten into um, the dog training industry, especially coming from a fitness perspective in, in my previous um, businesses, there's a lot of parallels between the fitness industry and the challenges that existed there, you know, when I started 10 years ago yeah. and the dog training industry, because at the end of the day, these are people that are generally trading their intellectual property for money. You know, they're trading time for money. And what's happened in the fitness industry that's very unique is that because of all these different platforms and because of social media and everything online, mm -hmm. there's a lot of personal trainers that have realized Hey, you know, I can monetize my my intellectual property and yeah. turn it into an asset for myself, to where I don't need to necessarily just trade my time for money. Definitely. Um, so that's kind of what we're trying to now innovate inside of the dog training industry. That's cool, man. Uh, I appreciate that. That was a really neat inside look at <laughs> kind of how how we got started and everything. Yeah. So uh, I'm I'm really excited, Gavin. Um, so for those of you who don't know yet, we did take on a new affiliate. It is our first and right now only affiliate. And that is Vintage Rebellion. Okay, Vintage Rebellion makes quality crafted leather products for your business. Okay, everything from accessories, bags, cell phones, cases, and wallets, whatever you need to carry and protect the things you use every day to run your business. You see, we have cell phones, we have tablets, we have microphones, and they make all that stuff. So now Vintage Rebellion has partnered with us on the Business and Brew Show to offer 10% off to you, our viewers and listeners simply go to leather.businessandbrewshow.com and put your email in the pop-up vintage rebellion focuses on attributes such as quality craftsmanship commitment to their customers and hard work those are at the forefront of everything they do so vintage rebellions per pervasive thinking here to ensure they put their custom themselves in their customers mindset as much as possible so one of the reasons that we chose this is i was on their website and if you take a look at what they offer it's top quality products gavin and i are about to get our own stuff and then who knows in the future maybe we'll be able to uh, offer stuff to guests as we uh, gain a little momentum there so that link again is leather.businessandbrewshow.com it is also in the description so click on that link, check out what they have going on, and thank you so much. So now, uh, we, we kind of uh, do dove pretty deep into their business, but <laughs> we definitely do a weekly follow-up. So, Gavin, uh, what, what have you been up to? Uh, nothing much. Just, uh, you know, staying busy, you know, 
work, home life, always, always fun, you know. Yeah, since they may not know, tell us. Yeah, tell us more. What you uh, do. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, just with home, I have a four-year-old married with a, you know, wife, of course, so mm-hmm. always fun there. Uh, for, for business, I'm in real estate as well as I do some consulting for automotive companies. So. Very cool. Oh, cool. So, a little bit of everything. <laughs> it feels like it, at least. <laughs> have you always been in this area? Yeah, I'm actually originally from here. Oh, wow. Uh, which Very is, cool. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a townie, so. Okay. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. I got, I got that move going on, so hopefully I finish that up soon. And then uh, I actually started working for a company called Screen Medics, <clears throat> mm-hmm. which is pretty exciting because he's a Marine. Mm-hmm. Um, he got out, I think, back in the 80s. And he's been an entrepreneur ever since. And I heard a little bit of his story yesterday when he stopped by to pick some stuff up. So it was, it was pretty exciting. He got out, went into real estate. Mm-hmm. And then his best year in real estate was 2006. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I don't know what happened after that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think so. that's something I really love about this area, though, is that when you come here, there's so much opportunity. Yeah. You could really get yourself into just about anything. I mean, I agree with that. anything. Yeah. Like, there's so much opportunity no matter what industry, no matter what interest you have. Definitely. Raleigh is the place to be. I mean, you've got a little bit of everything. And, and you know, yeah. even if it's not directly here, it's within an hour or two hour drive. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I think that's the cool thing is meeting other people in this area that have a variety of skills and, you know, even career paths just because it's so available and accessible here to really just seek those things out and take them up. Definitely. You know? Yeah, yeah that, cool. I mean, definitely are. I mean, and, and plus it seems like there's opportunity just above and beyond that. It seems oh. like there's a lot of stuff still growing. So it's not Yeah, like and this, the business. Southern hospitality, yeah. you know, as someone that's traveled to a lot of big cities for work, you know, I always come back home here and I realize how friendly and how open people are to share what they know and how excited they are to really pull people into the fold as far as what they do. You know, and you I think know, that's something yeah. I just... You don't find that everywhere else. And I think growing up here, mm-hmm. you almost take it for granted until you go to these bigger yeah, cities and you're like, whoa, why is everyone like this? Like, <laughs> yeah. Just be yeah. nice. You know? It's um, not hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, right? So, Gavin, uh, you you got the sampler pack here. Tell us what we're drinking today. Uh, doing Sierra Nevada today. Uh, they, of course, are uh, out of Hills, I'm sorry, Mills River, North Carolina. So, uh, it has a local brewery to North Carolina. So, yeah. cheers to that. Cheers to a good show. Absolutely. Cheers. 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 <laughs> there you go. Sorry, made my halfway, half my way through this. Yeah, that's, 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 right, that's cool. So, um, you guys kind of went into detail already about how you got started with the K9 performance. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about like what does the day to day look like with that? Yeah, um, it's very it's different kinda, with our different roles. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's we're mm-hmm. it's interesting because and you guys I imagine probably listen to Gary Vee and some of the mm-hmm. other guys out there and you know he has Once. a line yeah <laughs> he's got a line right? he's got a line he likes to say you know we are we are an we're a media company that happens to do X Y and Z and yeah. you know mm-hmm. we're kind of the same in that sense you know we focus a lot on providing content and education you know we realized when we got into this industry that not long ago, we were just consumers. We were people that had dogs, but didn't really understand the value or importance or fulfillment that can come from training your dog as a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And when we got into this industry and we really thought about, you know, what difference can we make here? It was really around the idea of education. And so um, my role is really taking the content that we, you know, record Natalie, whether it's a private lesson or whether it's, you know, a video concept that we've created or people from our audience that have, you know, requested videos. My role is a lot on creating content and putting together, you know, different educational materials that we can then share with our audience online. Um, Beyond that, you know, it's a lot of business development. So it's using, you know, different social networks. We do a lot on LinkedIn. We do a lot on Facebook and Instagram right now, just trying to really build that audience up and build the brand. Um, that differs a lot, though, from what, what Natalie does, so I'll let you yeah. obviously dive into that. <laughs> so my days, my day-to-days look uh, pretty different depending on if I have a dog with me. So I don't always have a board and train with me, so that's my most popular program. Um, if you're familiar with a board and train, it's where uh, a client will let me have their dog for 10 to 14 days or so, mm-hmm. um, and they stay with me, and then I, you know, every single day I'm doing training with them. Um, and then at the end of that time, I do a turnover lesson where I teach the owners everything that they need to know. So when I have a dog with me, um, I usually wake up pretty early, uh, around like 5.30 or so, and try to get to the gym, come back. Mm-hmm. And it just starts this day of walking, lessons, walking, lessons. So it's just like <laughs> a lot of like lessons throughout the day yeah. and like doing a lot of hands-on work with whatever 
um, that specific dog needs. And I think that's the most fulfilling part of my job is that every single day is different and there is always something to do of progress moving forward depending on that specific dog. So I have two dogs right now and one of them has a lot of confidence um, but is just like very pushy and has zero manners at all. (laughs) And the other dog that I have um, very mannerly. It has a really great foundation of obedience, but is just scared of everything. So zero mm. confidence, absolutely none. Um, so it's just like these, um, my days are just look really different, um, depending on like what I'm doing and which dog I'm touching. And then, um, yeah. So it's generally just, a lot of walking though. So when there's a dog, yeah, when there's a dog <laughs> yeah. and, and we've determined this because we, we got Apple watches last summer. And mm-hmm. so we, we like, you know, out of the, friendly spirit of competitiveness they're like all right we'll share who's you know who's walked more in the day and as soon as natalie got a dog her thing started going like eight to twelve miles a day just yeah. you know, with you know wow. all these lessons and what have you i said i'm taking this thing off I'm done, right? I'm not yeah. competing in this. um but yeah it's a you know it's a lot of walking for her and you know throughout that time you know generally speaking we're trying to put up an instagram post every day you know we're big on long format captions and we then take that and repurpose it into videos, you know, articles, podcasts, material. So we try to build our schedule around um, our focus, which is putting out great educational content and obviously then servicing our clients. And um, the day becomes, you know, somewhat of a system to where we can kind of check all the boxes off. And so we do our best to try and, and do that every day and kind of systematize it as much as possible. Nice. Yeah, sure. That's, that's really good. So well, with that, uh, that is, uh, yeah, that's very de- in-depth look there. So with that, I mean, is there a certain type of dog that you enjoy training more than others? Like, do you have a preference? Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, I, I don't, well, that's a really difficult question. Okay. I'm, I'm very much stumbling over that. Uh, just because they're, while more, like, fearful dogs can be challenging, they can also be significantly more fulfilling to train because you can, you know, take a dog that is very fearful of everything, won't take food from you, is, like, scared and barking at everything, and then be able to completely, you know, turn them around. Mm -hmm. And they went from, like, this very, uh, like, low state of living to a more fulfilled and higher state of living. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's always fun. But then also, again, like, if there's a dog that already has, like, a lot of great confidence and, you know, they're ready to, they're super food motivated and they're toy motivated, then you can, like, (laughs) take them everywhere and you can just kind of, like, clean up some of these, like, poor behaviors that they have and then, like, have a lot of fun with them. So there's, like, there's a little bit of aspects to to either one, but, yeah. yeah. I think we (laughs) tend to get a lot of working breeds, so, like, German Shepherds. Mm -hmm. Huskies, pit bulls, you know, yeah. we get a lot of working breeds because we have working breed dogs. And so yeah. we put out a lot of content around our dogs. Uh, and so I think that attracts that. people, yeah, yeah, people that can kind of resonate. And I think that's true for a lot of social media, right? Like we generally like to interact with other people that we can see a little bit of ourselves in because right. it kind of like it, it just, you know, we can resonate with a little deeper. So I think we tend to get a lot of requests for. Yeah. Working type breeds just because of the fact that we, you know, put a lot of content out with yeah. our dogs, which are working breeds. Like I just got a German Shepherd today, and then the other dog that I have is a Pitbull Border Collie mix, hmm. mm-hmm. yeah. which is int- I've <laughs> never seen it before. But super <laughs> smart, but then also pushy at the same time. Yeah. So it's just kind of a an interesting mix of, of personality that he has. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, and it I think a lot of it is you're really problem solving, right? So you're, it's a lot like you're working out or something else, you know, you, you're taking in a animal and you're trying to figure out exactly how you're going to resolve its issues using a, a tool belt, so to speak. Right. Mm-hmm. And that tool belt is motivation, timing, consistency. It's all these, you know, pillars, so to speak, that go into being able to solve that problem for that specific dog. And, you know, maybe nice. that, I think yeah. that's what, um, is probably the most exciting part about it is that you get to kind of like, figure out the puzzle each time and yeah. it's all different but you're using, the same, you're using the same you're using the same pieces but the way that the it's like a rubik's cube i guess right mm-hmm. like you're going for the same end result a nice balanced cube where all the sides match up but in order to do that based on where it started you're gonna have a much different path to getting there and i think that mm-hmm. at least for me being on the outside looking in natalie's training philosophy it's a lot uh i see her have the most fun figuring out those first big moves to where you get the momentum and then it's like oh boom 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 i'm done yeah. you know yeah. Yeah. i think that's what's cool to watch at least from like someone that's especially with the camera filming. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> right? definitely 
Uh, so it, it sounds like um, just in the short time that you guys have been doing this, uh, do you feel like you pivot a lot or you don't? And how does that, how do you feel that helps you? I feel like we definitely try and throw stuff at the wall pretty frequently. Yeah, and, we, we definitely do. <laughs> yeah, and I think that that's kind of what makes us stick out a little bit more compared to some other dog trainers. For me, at least, I never anticipated starting out with our dog training business and um, have like a, a pretty quickly growing online community. Um, <laughs> you guys, um, but in like a short period of time, like we, we did. And so from that, we've had to like really think of, think creatively, think outside the box and just kind of be like, if we do this, is this something that's going to work really well? If we do this, is this something that's going to stick really well? And I think that we've started over the past couple of months. Um, yeah, I, I think, yeah, I think, I think one of the things that has been has created a lot of pivots is just not under you know like i said not long ago we were consumers of the industry we were just people mm-hmm. that had dogs that had a, natalie had a training background but we weren't thinking like in the scheme of like all right how do we how do we plan for the next five years of building this business right mm-hmm. and the typical path when people start a dog training business is they start in their house or something then they move to a facility and then they get more trainers and they have another facility and then you know mm-hmm. etc And for us, you know, coming from a background where we've never had really a brick and mortar location and we've had a lot of online businesses, the idea of a commercial lease and like all these other things, we're just like, all right, that, you know, like we leaned away from that. We're like, let's go to what we know. Mm -hmm. And that created this whole business, uh, this whole online community in a way where we then had to pivot. But a lot of the pivoting is based on us learning different cadences of the industry, you know, for sure. understanding the difference between, say, protection dogs, dogs you see that are trained for military and police versus pet obedience and the different camps of dog training. You know, you've got people that believe in pure positive and you've got people like us that do balance training with different types of tools like prongs and e-collars. And so it's been um, interesting for us. A lot of the pivots have come once we've you know, immersed ourselves and realized like, hey, maybe there's a better way. Because when we started, we were super ambitious and we thought we knew what we wanted to do. And then once you have some, you know, paradigm shift or revelation, you go, oh man, this, I got to go back to the drawing board and totally redo this. So I've redone our website like three or four times now. (laughs) We've, you know, come out with different types of products and things. We just launched a digital platform. So now to now this point, you know, we're throwing a lot of um, stuff at the wall and kind of seeing what sticks. And then we see, when we see something that sticks, we kind of lean into it and, and chase it through. So that's kind of been what we've we've done so far. And um, right now it's culminated in this digital platform that we've created and, uh, you know, our, our obviously our in-person services that we offer. And, you know, that's what we're most focused on right now. Yep. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. 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 It is. I mean, on that same vein, what are some of the challenges that you that you've kind of encountered jumping into this new business? Um, you know, yeah, being that yeah. this kind we'll of touch new. on that. Yeah, I think that it's different for each of our different roles. I think yeah. that for me, I think I, I, don't, I don't know. Maybe you can correct me on this, but I feel like the challenges um, are more significant on my end mm-hmm. than perhaps like the growing the business end. Because right. I think that when you're growing a business, you're gonna encounter a lot of like the same sort of stuff while you're navigating through the industry. Mm-hmm. But for me as a trainer, um, a lot of the big challenges have been um, the dog training world is very opinionated, and when they are opinionated about something, they're opinionated about it. Um, loudly um, mm. and deeply and publicly and very, <laughs> very publicly yeah. very publicly um, and I think that when you uh, talk to a lot of other trainers they would definitely agree on the same vein of there's not a whole lot of cooperation so how Matt had talked about mm. there are different camps so to speak of just like there <clears throat> are the um, pure positive or force free trainers that's where you'll see a lot of like the clicker training not telling your dog no uh, you know very like hands off everything like that and then balance training where we do utilize a lot more you know tools in our training and stuff like that um, so within those two different camps um, even within our balance training community you would think that we would want to be collaborative as a whole mm-hmm. have a sense of community um, but then even then there are these pockets of people that firmly and loudly and publicly believe certain different things and um, kind of some of the challenges is that there's always new information that you can learn and for a trainer to know everything there's only a few of those trainers out there that know a lot of stuff and they've been around for forever so as like a a younger trainer so to speak 
Um, I think that that's been more of the challenge of just trying to um, put information out there and then be cognizant of that not everyone's going to agree with me and then that's going to be just, you know, okay. And for me, that's been like kind of the biggest challenge, I I think. think. I think to jump on that, um, to Natalie's point, I think one of the challenges is you know, whenever you become a subject matter expert, right? It, it's like the more you know, the less you realize you know, and yes. so you become you, you yeah. become you start to internalize and second guess yourself mm-hmm. when the expertise in your industry isn't necessarily consumer facing, right? And mm-hmm. so while there's all these discrepancies and nuances and opinions when it comes down to how you should train your dog, at the root of it, it's Hey, just get your ass outside and train your dog. You know, it's, it's the same like working out. It's like, oh, do you do keto? Do you vegan? Do this or that? Yeah. Beyond all of that, yeah. how about you just eat better and work out? You know, and that just motivating people to do that alone is what's most important. And people t- people tend to uh, get in their own way when they start internalizing. Let's go. Like, oh man, should I even put anything out because I don't know these little nuances? When yeah. the end consumer is really just like, hey, I was just f- trying to figure out how to walk my dog a little bit better, and your tip helped me. Yeah. And so it's, I think some of the challenges arise where um, we get in our own heads and we start second guessing. Yeah, should we put this out? Should we not put this out? And uh, usually we end up just saying, what are we thinking? Just put it out. Like at the end of the day, you know, the end consumer, the typical person that's just having their dog rush the door when a guest come, mm. comes over can benefit from just the, the simple things that anyone that trains dogs can agree on. And um, I think that's one of the main challenges when it comes to the training alone. Some of the challenges on the other end of the spectrum in more of my world, which is the business development, is trying to figure out you know which way to navigate. You know, Do we build a business model that pulls in a lot of people quickly? Do we continue doubling down on our brand and open our own facility? So those are some of the challenges that I face is, mm-hmm. is like, hey, what what move is the right move? And you know, at the end of the day, I don't really know. It's just gonna, whatever, whatever <laughs> the choice we end up making is probably the right move, right? Yeah. Um, but I think those are the challenges that we face, generally speaking, are mostly just us are in our own thoughts um and then a little bit of external <laughs> stuff yeah you know like it's it's just lack of uh i think anything when it comes down to anything entrepreneurial you know there is no roadmap and a lot of times when we get in our little you know tiffs and bicker or whatever it, it comes down to like we don't have a clear plan and the reality <laughs> is that when you're when you're self-employed or you're a one-man band or you have a company or you're a leader of any sort there's no clear plan you have yep. to you have to pave your own way and i think that's probably the, the hardest challenge there's you know? a lot of imposter syndrome that goes into that mm-hmm. yeah and, and it's staying motivated it's staying motivated when there isn't that lack of clarity and i think yeah. that that's yeah. probably you know there's a challenge every day but i think overarching it's it's um just maintaining that level of motivation and then sticking mm-hmm. true um i like to say you know the show must go on so that that's kind of what always brings us back to a baseline of like whatever happened like we just need to get it done you know and that yeah. that's kind of what pulls us through i feel like those challenging times nice uh, so I'm kind of curious, uh, have you ever had a dog that like, either, I wouldn't say, maybe you couldn't train them or maybe it was just more difficult or you felt like, yeah. like, tell me about that. There's definitely been more difficult in challenging dogs, but I've never had a dog that I could not train that I've just, I'd have to call the owner and be like, Hey, this is just not working. Um, like, <laughs> come get your dog. Okay. Um, and I think that the reason kind of behind that is that I um, have strived really, really hard since I've entered the industry to educate myself in as many different ways as possible. I don't yeah. think that there's like a, a time that I'm at the gym or like a time that I'm getting ready in the morning or long walks that I'm going on that I'm not constantly listening to an audiobook, listening to a dog yeah. training podcast. Mm-hmm. I'm not reading <laughs> several different books like at one time attending webinars go to in-person seminars like we traveled to florida so i could go to a seminar from a guy that came all the way from australia um and so when you arm yourself with all these different tools in your toolbox um when you get a dog that's like a lot more difficult instead of just being like you know uh, what's that saying that you always say rounds a uh, square peg round hole or what do you say? Like, <laughs> I don't know if I ever said that. No, when, like you're, when you're Michael? trying to like you know a square try... peg into a round hole. Thank you. Yeah, that one. Is that I say that all? I don't. 
Yeah, you do. Oh, all right. Uh, <laughs> <my place. laughs> and so, like, with some trainers, if they don't have all those tools in their toolbox of the different ways of training a dog, mm-hmm. which there's a lot of them, then that's where you come up with, like, a lot of friction with training the dog, and then it's just, it can't work through. Yeah. But, like, that's one of the things of, I, I have so many tools in my toolbox that I haven't really had a dog that I'm just like... Yeah. You gotta go home. Like, sorry. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> I feel like we do. We do. We also put a big emphasis on education, like I said. And so, you know, we do a very thorough job of auditing our client, like potential clients, right? So when someone says, "I need my dog trained," you know, we have a very specific system nice. of questions and you know consultation calls where we evaluate if it's going to be a good fit or not. Because right. there are some things we don't do, right? We don't deal with aggressive dogs right now, for instance, right? Mm-hmm. Because we're not really prepared to do that, you know, operating out of our home still and things like that, you know, you really need to work with someone that has worked with a lot of aggressive dogs. And so there's, we have certain channel partners that if we get a request like that, we'll send it out. And so that kind of eliminates some of the, you know, when it comes, it's like, you know, for some, a lot of our clients, you know, their dog is pretty much the equivalent of, you know, your four year old dog, right? Yeah. Yeah. Your dog, like, you know, it's, it's very important to them. And the worst thing in the world you want to do is, you know, be a little ambition and say, yeah, when you really should say no, you know, and I think we do a good job of making sure that we don't bite off more than we can chew because, um, fortunately for our business model, we don't rely on the training to just, you know, operate our business. Right. And so we, we get to be a little more selective and we can, um, you know, refer people when we feel like there's a dog that might not be a good fit for what we can offer is so, um, I think that's one way that we avoid having to deal with that situation yeah. too, because that would be very embarrassing and <laughs> also just like extremely frustrating. Yeah. yeah. Um, especially when there's a lot of dogs with like simpler issues out there that we can 100 percent solve. So. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's always good to make sure it's a good fit both ways. I mean. Definitely. I think a lot of business owners don't realize that every customer or a client's not a good client or a good fit for them. For sure. Yeah. yeah. There's definitely some clients that have reached out to me, and I've kind of like put them on the back burner a little bit and Mm -hmm. kind of seeing if like they will pursue me more because dog training is not just like you send your dog to me and then the problems are all fixed. That's Mm -hmm. not how it goes. There's like a, it's a lifestyle change from there on forward and Mm -hmm. you become a minority as a dog owner to have a trained dog. If you have a trained dog, you are a minority like dog Mm -hmm. owner now because the majority of dogs are not trained not yeah. trained at all and so that's the progressive work that you must do over time and so I make that abundantly clear to my clients of just like when your dog goes home like there's a three week extensive period of time that I'm going to give you like deliberate training things to do for your dog in specific and then for a next three months is a very pivotal time and you must be consistent and then even after that it's going to be mm-hmm. for the life of the dog but like yeah. I'm setting the expectation already um, and then if I kind of get like some waffling about on that of like um, and I'm just like mm, maybe not a good fit See, I don't think that you're ready to have a trained dog yet yeah. so and it's being able to and that you know that's a lot of why we're canine you know our URL we, we do a lot of we brand ourselves as canine performance coach because it's not just training right there's a level of leadership and motivation and things that we really focus on yeah. to make people feel like they have that arm of support and that's why we do focus so much on education um, is because it's very easy to think that, Hey, you know, I pay this, you know, decent sum of money and I'm gonna get my dog trained and boom, I'm, we're, you know, everything's kosher. But at the end of the day, it's it, and why I think I enjoy it so much is because it reminds me a lot of fitness where you can't just give someone a workout plan and a diet and then say, mm-hmm. cool, we'll check in in two weeks and everything's hunky dory. You know, I expect you to hit, you know, like throughout that two weeks and be hard. They're going to call <laughs> you and tell you they're hungry. You know, there's so many <laughs> yeah. things that are going to happen throughout that period that you need to be prepared to offer that support and that guidance and that level of motivation that takes it much beyond just a simple training, right? You know, it's really coaching because it, it's a lifestyle, just like fitness and seeing results in, in that regard it's all about adhering to a, a plan and so that we we try to put a lot of mindfulness into the different protocols that we send people home with and the different plans and the level of education we provide them with so that they For really sure. understand how important it is and to upkeep the training and then also feel like they have the confidence to really you know do it on their own once they take their dog home from us yeah that's, nice. that's, yeah. that's awesome so <laughs> can i ask a selfish question Absolutely. Uh, are they? Um, what dogs would you recommend um, as good family dogs? I mean, for labs. families that have laps. Labs, yeah. for yeah. sure. Sorry, I had, <laughs> sure. I had to get my. my yeah, my, or even right. a golden. But labs, <laughs> I I love labs. 
for sure. They're just, they're motivated. They're so friendly. Um, and I feel like most of the time they have a good, like, on and off switch. So if you want to have a dog, like, for you, Mm -hmm. you can, like, go into the backyard. You can play fetch. You can be your running partner. Great. And then, you know, you can also have a dog that can just chill out, kind of be a couch potato and, Mm -hmm. like, (laughs) hang out with your young child and, you know, like, not be doing the zoomies that will get your child to do the zoomies or when your child does the zoomies the dog does the zoomies so it's easier, pretty easier to train yeah. it's easier to i think that's one thing too that you know i think that's another reason why we focus so much on the educational side is because it's very easy to just go out there and get the dog you think is cool and that's exactly yeah. what we did when we were just like yeah. we're like huskies are cool they look cool you know german, german shepherd, shepherd they're yeah. cool but like god we didn't know about the whining about all these other oh, nuances god. that go into owning those dogs um and so you know like i think it's not that we were wrong for doing that but it's just you don't know what you don't know and no. Yeah. Historically, in the dog training industry, right now, if I were to if I were to ask, you know, most people who they think of when they think dog trainer, most of them still say Caesar Milan, the dog whisperer, oh. <laughs> from yeah. like over a decade ago. Yeah. Yeah, over a decade ago, he was on TV, yeah. but he was really the only like mainstream mm-hmm. dog educator out there. That you know, common person that doesn't even maybe have a dog. Oh yeah, Caesar Milan, you know. And, and I think that's different. Yeah, it wasn't pure positive. No, yeah, and no. and I think ultimately that showed us like hey there's a big opportunity in this space because if people are still thinking of this person from over 10 years ago not that he's you know that irrelevant now but you know if this is the person that people think of it means that this industry is prime and ready for someone new or a series of new people to step in and really do it in a 2020 way you know create the youtube videos create the instagram content do it all do it the way that all these other people in these other industries do it and so Mm -hmm. i think that's another reason why you know we're so passionate about the education part is just because it wasn't long ago that we were just naive and it wasn't any fault of our own so there's so much information out there you're just like i don't know what to look at all of it is controversial too like if you go on google i'll tell you like 15 different things so and i reference that all the time when i like make instagram posts and stuff like that i'm like i put in my captions i'm just like i went to google and i typed this in and the first two things were the things that you should absolutely 100 percent not listen to at all and so there's like so much misinformation out there that's why i'm like very passionate and just like here's all the stuff i know like here like just it's out there it's out there and continuously doing that like every day the gift and the curse of the internet. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right? exactly. 100%. That's crazy. So we heard how you guys started, kind of where you're at now. Uh, where do you, where do you see this going in in the next you know five years or long term? Yeah, there's been so many pivots. So at this current moment of pivot, I think you'd probably have a better outline than than I would. Yeah, I I think at, at this time, you know where we see the future going is a combination of. Yeah, I guess to dial back, really what our whole brain is about is educating the end consumer. So educating, you know, the common person that has a dog that, you know, might not know what to do. Um, And also helping other independent trainers succeed. You know, we fortunately come from a different business background where we were able to see a clear picture of how to turn this into a full on business and career for ourselves. Um, But what we're really passionate about and having made so many friends in this industry is like, how do we turn the faucet on for all these other people, you know, knowing what we know about digital marketing and selling online and creating, you know, monetizing intellectual property. That's a lot of the innovation that we're bringing. And so over the next few years, you know, it's going to be building out our digital platform with other trainers, other type of coursework, you know, really building a credible hub where people can, you know, get all the information they need to train their dog at home on their own or feel confident, feel confident enough to work with a trainer that's on side of the platform that, they can then bring their dog to wherever they might be. Um, the other prong of that is obviously supporting these other independent trainers with the resources they need to succeed. So that's you know bringing them onto our platform in a way where they can earn passive revenue, um, mm-hmm. nice. and also build their brands as a proxy, you know, to being a part of our ecosystem. And so I think over the next five years, I'm not sure exactly how that will extrapolate out. It could be brick and mortar facilities. It could be just the digital hub. But I know that regardless of what particular path it takes it'll be focused on educating the general public mm-hmm. on making quote unquote or hashtag make making dog make training dog cool, training cool. <laughs> um, yeah. but also you know helping these other trainers in the industry that are independent you know succeed uh, by giving them the resources they need to do that because right now you know a lot of dog trainers face the same challenges that personal trainers faced 10 years ago you know if you were a personal trainer 10 years ago you either went to other people's apartment gyms or you did group classes outdoors you're really in hustle mode you know like scrapping around 
and you're trading your time for money. You can go and work at a big box facility where maybe you sacrifice your methodology for the corporate model and how you're told to train people, which isn't really fulfilling. Or you had to go full on entrepreneur, you get your commercial lease, you buy all your equipment, you get, you eat what you kill, you have to market, you have to learn how to do all these things. And the truth of the matter is not everyone that's a subject matter expert at what they do is a great business operator or owner or even aspires to have the responsibility to do all those things. And so um, those are the same challenges that a lot a lot of dog trainers face. You know, there are people that have come out of extensive careers prior. Um, there are people that are amazing at training dogs and have a connection with animals. They might just not love all the other aspects of it where they want to have to make that sac- sacrifice in any of those three departments. And so um, that's part of the problem that we're still trying to tackle is how can we be a part of the you know, industry in a way where we can be part of the the chain, the supply chain, so to speak, right? Where people can come to us and say, hey, you know, I've got this stuff, I've got all these clients, but man, I need help. You know, I can't be walking eight to 10 miles a day for the rest of my life. How do I, how do I make this video series once? And then, you know, knowing that the education isn't going to change a ton, how do I then turn that into something that I can then make money from time and time again in a way to use that as even a funnel for me to end up with more in-person clients. And so um, that's a lot of what our focus is right nice. now. Yeah. 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 That's pretty that's cool, awesome. man. Yeah. Um, so I think we're ready for the next yeah. segment. Next segment. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty I like sure it. I put the wrong number there, so yeah. I'm just going to say the next one is... Uh, Three questions we have, bro. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I like it. Yeah. 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 Either one of you oh, can answer gets or gets both it. can answer. So cool. okay. it's, it's cool. cool. Yeah. We're very laid back, so it's cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, first one is... Um, what content or what books are you reading? Like, what content are you consuming or what books are you currently reading? Yeah. Oh, man. I know that was Instagram, fire to talk about that. <laughs> yeah. Instagram, pay attention. This one, uh, I always get questions on this of what am I currently consuming? Uh, so right now, some of the books that I'm currently reading is the Dog Aggression Workbook, uh, volume number three. Mm. So I am currently going through that one. Um, I am also going through, I'll actually pull it up because I don't want to misread it. Um, so that's one of them. Um, I am also going through the book. Um, I'm rereading it again, actually. It's by uh, Temple Grandin, Animals Make Us Human. So this will be my second time going through that one. Um, and then Canine Body Language by uh, Brenda Aloff. So going through that. Um, And then in terms of um, audio content and visual content, if you have not subscribed to the Canine Paradigm Patreon, I constantly am re-watching Pat Stewart's videos. Uh, He just put up a phenomenal one today, so doing that. Um, And I think that's actually it at the current moment. That's a lot. Yeah. yeah. That's, 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 well, a lot. that's a lot of walking. You got you know, eight, ten miles a day. You got a lot of, you got a lot of audio time. You know what I'm saying? Variety of podcasts, <laughs> which yeah. I won't bring up. See, yeah. don't that's teach the dogs to talk. I, you know, I'm getting there. We well, usually try to teach them to stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> usually, they, usually that's a problem. It's because they're talking too much. Yeah. Yeah. Um, to answer that question on, on my end, you know, it's interesting. I kind of float around and I, I don't. I actually, you know, I used to consume Gary Vee and Grant Cardone and, and all the self-development guys. And um, I feel like, you know, at a certain point, you kind of reach a threshold where you're like, I get it. You know, I need to go out there and, and as right. Gary says, right, do yeah, stuff. Yeah. But uh, one guy I always really enjoy listening to is Andy Frisella. I don't know if you guys are familiar with him. Um, he had a really popular podcast called The MF CEO Project. Um, he just started a new one called Real AF. But he's just like a real gritty guy. You know, he says he says what he means. The camera flew off. Um, he says it like it is. Um, it resonates with me because it's a little more like in your face, like, you know, uh, br- just brute, uh, point blank. Mm-hmm. But, you know, another uh, podcast that I started listening to um, is actually Controlled Aggression, which is by a, a guy named Jerry Bradshaw here, uh, local in the area. He's out in Sanford. He actually oh, he's started. Okay. Oh. oh, yeah. No, you're good. Today. You're good. Um, but yeah, I've been listening to Controlled Aggression because I'm actually interested in going to trainer school um, through their program out in Sanford just because he started the uh, Protection Sport Association, mm-hmm. uh, which is basically 
arguably one of the most challenging dog sports where you train a dog to do obedience, bite work, all these different types of um, things related to dog training. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the most rigorous uh, sports when, you know, in dog training out there. So, (laughs) yeah, I'd be happy to. We're not live on camera. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah, so I've been listening to that podcast. And then aside from that, you know, I... I don't consume a ton of different people, but I try to be observant with how other people are succeeding online. So, you know, I watch a lot of different types of uh, content in our industry and dog training and see what other dog trainers, like what content they're putting out and what keywords they're using. I try to read their captions and and really just emulate what other people are doing to succeed. So it's a variety of stuff, but it it kind of floats through those kind of three things and YouTube browsing and then those two podcasts I really I like to listen to a lot. And How I Built This by Guy Raz. That's if, oh, you got, yeah. like that. if anyone out there hasn't listened to How I Built This, I think that's like mm-hmm. the gold standard of audio content. Yeah. It's like if you can do a show like that, like you've got it. But I think it's really cool to listen to the founders of these huge companies and yeah. realizing, you know what? Like at the end of the day, these guys put their pants on the same way. And they started out in a room just like this at one point, yeah. you know, trying to figure it all out. So I, I love that podcast. I think Definitely. probably more than anyone I listen to that. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty cool, man. So, uh, so when y'all, <laughs> if y'all aren't training dogs, what do you like to do for fun? <laughs> yeah, what, I mean, we do. What, what we do? do? We're big into fitness, so you yeah. know, we work yeah. out every day. Usually, you know, um, we're very like regimented to some degree, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know. Personally, I feel like I'm more productive when I have a routine yeah. that I can stick to. I yeah, find, I you know, we <laughs> we enjoy traveling a lot, um, so we always find an excuse to travel, and, you know, generally speaking, we'll figure out a way to make it work productive, too. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, usually, it's not a vacation. It's, like, some kind of, like, travel that involves our dogs or something, <laughs> but yeah. I find that, and I've, like, had this realization recently, is, like, when I go to a new city or state or whatever, I'm pretty much just trying to like replicate my at home routine in a new place and like be like fill it out, you know, because I've always aspired to leave North Carolina and spread my wings and like live somewhere different. I haven't found the right place yet, but when I travel places, I'm like, where's the gym? What place am I going to eat at? And I get a kick out of like figuring out my spots in these new places. So yeah. we enjoy that. Um, we really love going to the mountains and hiking and yeah. just being outdoors with the dogs where they can be off leash. And uh, we haven't actually been able to do as much of that lately, unfortunately, but. Maybe in the warmer months that are that yeah. coming up, we'll make our way up to Boone and uh, do some good old hiking on Grandfather Mountain. So. I think we just truly do, just genuinely enjoy doing productive things. I think we just get a kick out of it. Yeah, we, we kind of like working, <laughs> but I, I think also, too, you know, we are, we've done so many things and we've been involved with so many other projects and companies and businesses that um, we're really focused on just trying to, like, win you know like there's something about like building something from nothing and having a goal in mind and being able to really see that through without getting distracted and i think when we when you have the agency and other things where it's very project to project you know now we're in something where we're like man this is like really up to us you know we really have the ability to turn this you know we have all the skills we need to make this successful we can bootstrap we can do these things but Mm -hmm. um i think we've been really focused on trying to you know really achieve that goal uh, that we have in mind for the business so yeah. Perfect. Yeah. I'm really good. Yeah, that's, that's definitely is good. And uh, our last question: uh, How can people find out more about you? Uh, yeah. Where can they find you? Instagram, podcast, you can shop, find us find you. everywhere. Everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. Um, usually, you can find us anywhere from searching Canine Performance Coach, Canine okay. Performance, or Natalie Dobkins. Mm-hmm. Um, we're on Spotify. We have the Canine Performance Podcast, which. Nice is generally just a deeper, de- more conversational dive into whatever the Instagram post for the day was. Um, on Instagram, we're canine underscore performance. So if you're into dog training and you want to get some tips and tricks on how you might be able to start working with your dog at home, uh, it's a great place to find daily mm-hmm. content. Nice. And then uh, we have our digital platform, which is canine performance online. That's for people that want to basically have a, a trainer in their back pocket where they can kind of get the, the community support they need. They can connect with like-minded mm-hmm. people and uh, go through the coursework uh, lesson by lesson, step by step. So those are the, those are the three main places. Um, of course, our website, canineperformancecoach.com. So if someone in this area, what, yep. you know, your dog need your dog's acting up and you need some help, uh, definitely let us know there, and uh, we can take care of you. So. Yeah, nice. <laughs> awesome. I dig it. So yeah, I definitely uh, put your website in the description so they can click on it. Awesome. Um, yeah, so uh, basically, as we wrap up the live portion, uh, what I'd like to do is uh, our number one focus is always helping other people. So whether that's spotlighting business owners in different industries 
or you as the viewers learning something that we talked about on the show, whether it has to do with the more general business development aspect or the industry specific stuff. Um, so in order to thank them, in order to help support us, go ahead and like and share this video. Um, it, of course, you can follow our Facebook page. Um, tonight we did not go live on YouTube, but it will definitely be on YouTube at 11 a.m. tomorrow. Uh, we did alter the schedule a little bit there, but we go on pretty much every major podcast platform. So please find us on your favorite uh, podcast and give it a like and a five-star review so we can continue bringing this type of content uh, to the uh, to, to the viewers, to you, the viewers. Um, so before we do uh, the little farewell, which I'll, I'll probably let Gavin do. He's pretty good at it. Uh, I get to do it this time. <laughs> but, uh, I, like it, I, like I do want to tell everyone, because we didn't tell you last week, but what actually happens when we kill the live here is we continue with what I call the after show. And it's just basically everything we're talking about now, but in a little bit more relaxed fashion. And what that is designed to do is to bribe you into watching the recorded version once it posts on Monday. So if you're interested in what Matthew and Natalie are talking about, then be sure to tune in uh, tomorrow when it goes up on Facebook and YouTube um, or Wednesday if you like the podcast at 7 a.m. to listen to what we talk about because I'm sure we're going to dive more into depth on uh, that stuff. And with that being said, thank you so much thank for you. watching. Yeah, I like your outro better. Oh, okay. <laughs> hey, we, maybe we you appreciate it. I guess I can <laughs> one. Yeah. I thought it was like a little song and a dance. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah we got the we have to rename the after show to the after party. Okay, yeah. I'm down for that. So jo join us later for the what? What? <laughs> I thought you okay. I, I dig it. But thanks so much guys for watching and we'll see you on the next episode. Oh, models and models. <laughs> 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 yeah, models and models. Thanks, thanks for having us, guys. Yeah. Oh, no, it's no, it's really you, cool. Thank you all for coming. Um, I, I, we really appreciate it. And yeah. yeah. Actually, looking forward to following you guys because yeah, um, yeah. there's a lot that yeah. we can learn from, from both of you. Yeah, absolutely. Let us know how we can be an asset. You know. It just kind of occurred to me that this is kind of the first time that we've really been asked a lot of questions like about like more business specific stuff. We get asked yeah. a lot of questions, but it's like. Hey, my dog is jumping. Usually, on we there. create our own questions. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> people are curious about. Um, yeah, yeah, no, it's it's cool because uh, I'm a big talker, but I don't get the opportunity to like, talk a lot. Yeah. I'm usually, you know, doing Ryan's job, like producing, <laughs> and editing, yeah. like I'm holding a the camera. There's been times actually where I've like been on site somewhere and been filming all day, and then I look up and I'm like, oh my god, I mean, like. I've been like literally living here through this like little like you know, little <laughs> yeah. monitor half the size of the screen and yeah. yeah it's cool to be able to put my head up and be actually you know a experiencing it yeah yeah <laughs> so you've kind of done a little bit of everything man from fitness to yeah to, to a little bit of everything yeah That's I awesome. I uh I I don't know if I take a lot of pride I think in different parts of my life I've taken different levels of pride in the fact that I've done a lot of different stuff but yeah man I've been well, that's what life is for man taste a little bit of everything yeah you, you know um I really have always hated that saying jack of all trades master of none I just like I really enjoy and there's a lot of the reason I want to go to this dog training school is because I'm just like a collector of trade skills I just yeah. enjoy learning um all these different unique things and we'll call you a renaissance man yeah yeah, that sounds, sounds, that sounds like way better. That. Yeah, I like yeah. that. Um, but what's been cool, I think, kind of having this entrepreneurial bug has been figuring out how to take those skills that I've accumulated and 
layer them on top of one another in a way that's mm-hmm. actually beneficial. So they're not like all separate from one another, you know? Right. Like when I was in fitness, I started out training people, taking them from shit to fit. That was my tagline back in the day. <laughs> um, and then I'm I picked big. up the video camera and then I used the video camera to amplify that. And mm-hmm. when I was done with that, I used the camera to uh, network with all these other people. So throughout that time, I was building these Facebook pages and learning about drop shipping and all the print on demand and all these mm-hmm. things that you know, you don't necessarily learn when you go to school or you take a traditional route, you know, I was just in these online communities swimming in them. And, you know, whenever I thought there was something that caught my interest, I just try to learn and I try to take the skill I had to increase my earning power. So when I stopped doing the fitness stuff, uh, for a few years, I actually just vlogged for people remotely. So I'd have Hmm. these big influencers that didn't need a D-Rock, they didn't need a professional shadow, they need a salary, but like, hey, I can hold my camera and just send you this footage. And so we did. A, I did a lot of remote editing. Um, I did some in-person editing with big influencers and stuff. By the way, he's a huge Gary V fan. I don't know if he's... Oh, <laughs> yeah, are you? He's like That's how I got Gary started v. with <laughs> my business years ago. He I, heard, said, I remember uh, I heard one little clip of your, interview of your uh, I think yeah. maybe like your second or yeah. third podcast. Yeah. yeah. So he uh, he said that him and his brother would go into stores and scan stuff, and that's how I met <laughs> Gavin. Yeah. I was like, "Yeah, I'm gonna do that." So I just started a Dollar Tree with Amazon selling on Amazon, and then uh, my buddy found a a, a meetup, mm. and I went there, and he was building and automating his business so that he could go to real estate school and still uh, have an income. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's how we ended Man, up meeting. I've always that's been cool. I've always been interested by Amazon FBA, and I think that's what like I just have this. I've I'm so interested by things, and so whenever mm-hmm. like I get an interest, I I hate feeling like I'm on my own learning stuff. So I try yeah. to like use what I have. I'm like hey, I got I can take your. Amazon photos, like into product photos, can you teach me that? So that's yeah. kind of how I've like yeah. accumulated these skills. Is like, hey, scratch my back, I scratch yours, you yeah. know. But yeah. Amazon's one beast that I've never fully tackled. You know, I've been a part yeah. of like some different retail projects that have obviously needed Amazon yeah, to course, yeah. survive. But I've always been interested by like the people that have done FBA and then end up with like a tiny warehouse that then like <laughs> turns into like this twenty thousand square warehouse and then like boom, now we've got this whole distribution company. So. Yeah. It's definitely, like, one of those things where it's always been, like, hmm, I wonder if I could learn that, but I haven't had, like, the time to dedicate towards learning. I feel like it's a big endeavor. So, the, the reason that the table is over here is because that's what all that stuff is. So, oh, yeah. I, I help nonprofits sell their stuff on Amazon. Oh, nice. Oh. Um, Very cool. So, what I like about it and what I found is because it's a service, it's yeah. better. Yeah. Because the profit is profit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. As opposed to having to reinvest in inventory. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is the master bedroom slash yeah. studio. <laughs> and that bathroom is full of more products. Oh, wow. Like, it's so you go basically. all kinds of products then, I guess. You're not like one. You're so not like what, selling sponges all day. Yeah. Okay. So I do what's called arbitrage. So I don't actually have my own product. Okay. Um, cool. Arbitrage is, is touchy. It can be very profitable. Like, yeah, that's what Gary Vee was Yeah, I was going to say, that's a big word. Yeah, it's a Gary Vee word for yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think Probably many people, yeah. like, I think Gary's responsible for, like, millions of people actually understanding the definition of arbitrage because yeah. he's used it so much. <laughs> 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 Shout out to Gary Vee for uh, teaching people what arbitrage means. But, yeah, but yeah, no, very cool. Very cool. What I guess what, like, how'd you catch the bug for that? Or how'd you figure out that it's something that you enjoyed? Yeah. I just, I was kind of, okay, so let's see. I was in sales. And then I, I closed a bunch, and I came up with a sheet. I had corporate check it. They owed me money for closed sales. Mm-hmm. It wasn't working out. I had a meeting that same the same day I quit that job um, with another guy that was working on a pretty cool project. But he, uh, I think one reason he had gotten me and my fiance involved in it was because he kind of lacked the... Uh, I'm trying to think of the word I'm looking for. Maybe the confidence, but he wasn't much of like, I'm here, I'm in front of you, I'm loud, pay yeah. attention yeah. to me, yeah. you know? He was a very, very quiet guy. Um, it could have been something big, but we just, because we kind of lacked that direction, mm-hmm. you know, we were like, well, we never really decided to stop, but then we didn't really ever hear from him again. Mm-hmm. So I was like, all right, am I going to actually go back to work or what am I going to do? So mm-hmm. I started work from home jobs. They were pretty cool. Um, it didn't really pay that great. Uh, I ended up getting a call three years later from a lawyer because they were under a lawsuit. So I was like, well, I'm kind of oh, glad sure. that didn't work yeah. out. <laughs> then I, I was like, well, I, I worked at Applebee's when I got out of the Army. Mm-hmm. I did it before I went in the Army, so I couldn't do that. Then uh, 
uh, the, the group here was just it was, it was crazy things happened. I was mm-hmm. like, this is not a good environment. So I bounced there, went across the way to uh, another restaurant, worked there, um, d- didn't like the management, mm-hmm. um, got fired, got rehired, got fired again. <laughs> um, in fact, I, I think, I'm not sure if I did the podcast ones, but on the podcast, if you go back, because we rebranded my show. Oh, did you? For oh. this. Uh-huh. Yeah, so if you go back on the podcast far enough, you'll probably find an episode that says I got fired. <laughs> and, and that's what, that's kind of what I'm talking about. And yeah. so uh, I heard the Gary Vee episode finally, because I, I think I've been listening to him since like 2012. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, it's like crazy. an OG. Yeah. 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 I, well, well, I heard about him when I, I, I feel like right ago. about the time uh, I got to Fort Hood mm-hmm. in the Army. And so I, I wasn't consuming a lot of his content because it wasn't... Yeah. Probably different back then, yeah. As easily yeah. accessible, yeah. 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 Um, but, um, yeah, so I, I listened to him and I, I heard him talk about him and his brother Scan stuff. I was going to school to get my bachelor's. Um, I was in Dr. Denning's uh, critical thinking class, which Dr. Denning was actually my, I, I'm pretty sure he was my first guest ever on my show. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, cool. um, so that video is out there somewhere. And uh, he was teaching critical thinking. Great guy. I was in a class with this guy named Michael. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to sell on Amazon. He was like, I got this, uh, this uh, shoot, what's the guy's name? Ryan Grant? Maybe mm-hmm. um, the online selling experiment. Uh-huh. It's a website, a blog, and whatever. Okay. Yeah. He was like, "Yeah, I got this. You can borrow it if you want." So me and Michael kind of figured it out at first, and it was literally just the app. Once you pay the subscription, you go in, you scan the stuff, and oh, wow. sell it on the internet. Yeah, I feel like I'd seen, I've seen some kind of something like that where someone's like, "You scan it, you see what it's selling, for, like the aggregate of what it sells for, and yeah. then you decide yeah. if it's you know." It's it's worth probably it. a lot more complicated than I make it sound, but for the the simple fact that you already know the technology aspect, mm-hmm. it would be easier. And, uh, and, and I mean, people have their opinions. I got a guy tells me arbitrage isn't profitable. Mm-hmm. Um, but the fact that I figured out how to sell other people's stuff, it increases their revenue. Oh, I had sure, one yeah. client try to back out and I was like, well, what were your online sales before? And they were like, zero. <laughs> I was like, so whatever number I bring you <laughs> yeah, is better. automatically more than that. <laughs> Um, so it, it's good though, but also, uh, they're all nonprofits. So yeah. like, uh, Mabu Pony, I'll, I'll throw their name out there. They're mm-hmm. a small nonprofit. They're down in Apex. They're off 64. They hold two sales a month, 11 months out of the year. Okay. Wow. So that's 22 sales a month. A year. Or, or sorry, a year. Yeah. Um, so the point I'm getting at is they're very limited, especially mm-hmm. because they don't have an online presence. Yeah. Um, now they do, and we're making progress, but it's under my Amazon account. Mm-hmm. So, I, so I take a commission for the the product that I sell, and I charge a processing fee. Gotcha. So the advantage is once we're through the three month proof of concept phase, and I do a case study. Yeah. This is what we started with. This is where we're at right now. Mm-hmm. I'm going to use that to leverage, you know, getting other clients. But if they're happy with the results we can start their own Amazon account. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and now there's gating, there's ungating, um, there's there's a lot of, you know. Nuances, I'm put, sure. Yeah, so the transition, I would never recommend if someone is currently selling through someone like me mm-hmm. um, and, and then they want to start their own Amazon account, I would never recommend just ceasing all sales and standing up your own mm-hmm. because you'll lose a lot of revenue doing that due to the gating. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. But if you make a smooth transition, then what I'm getting at is they'll be able to be represented online much better. Gotcha. They'll be able to have the Amazon storefront. Then I feel like their sales could increase because people like a cause. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so my Amazon account, I can't have that cause because I'm not them and I represent mm-hmm. multiple clients. But once they have that cause up there, Mad Pony is the village in Africa that they support. Yeah. They build schools. They help children. Yeah. And, like, I think there's three board members, and I'm pretty sure they're the only paid people. And one of them is the, the I don't know what the position is called, but she's the lady in charge. Mm-hmm. And she works there, like, 20 freaking hours a day. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah so it's, it's great. I love them. Yeah, that's and, awesome. Uh, yeah, I think one thing that I've, like, realized over the past few years is how... Like I think a lot of people out there probably just don't realize that like Amazon's really just a search engine for products. Like mm-hmm. it's a search engine, and 
it wasn't until I was working on this cell phone accessory product last year that I really understood like, oh wow, this is like a whole another level. Like the products that you even see that pop up <laughs> are a result of someone playing the game the right way. You yeah. know, like conquesting a keyword or this yep. or that. You know, yeah. we were like, <laughs> oh, pop socket, you know, we gotta we gotta outspend them on the West Coast from nine to twelve and then, you know, <laughs> really dive deep on it from three to six here on the East Coast. Yeah. Like you're just like for someone that's never exposed it, I'm like, what in the world is this? Like, you know, a totally different, like, whirlwind of things. Like, where, it, yeah, it seemed, like, really crazy. <laughs> it seemed like a Wild West still to some degree. But yeah. it also seemed like there's, like, the Amazon, like, Illuminati of, like, how you can do it the right way. Like, I don't know. It's, it's yeah, very yeah. interesting. But sometimes it's, like, the more you learn, the more you're like, whoa, that's a whole beast, like, in and of itself. Um, but, yeah, thanks for sharing. No, that's interesting. Yeah, but definitely. It's a, it's a cool thing to jump into because... I think that so many people are like, they don't realize like what opportunities are out there, you know, yeah. to just like take control of, you know, like I'm, I sound very similar to you where like I'm just not super employable, but like by most people, because I'm just like, I like to do what I like to do when I want to do it. And I don't, you know, like there's a certain way I want yeah. my life. And I'm sure, I, especially after having a long career, having to then work for someone that's like, do this, do that. It's like, eh, I've done that for a long time. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so I think it is cool that like, you know, there is so much opportunity online to really just like start, you know, yeah. just like you said, just start and get out yeah. of your way and just put yourself out there and see what comes of it. And, uh, you know, I was fortunate to have experienced that and got, I, I consider myself very lucky cause I was just, I was literally just a kid just diddling around on the forums and, you <laughs> know, had an opportunity come up that I just leaned into and out of complete luck, you know, was awarded this thing that ended up creating a whole business for me out of it with very little work. But yeah. Um, I think that, you know, in 2020 now, there's just, there's so much opportunity to do that. I mean, start a dog business, start a, you know, just start putting content out to where people feel like they want to reach out and pay money. I mean, I don't think we would have ever expected people, you know, following us on Instagram, clicking on a link, booking a time on Calendly, putting their credit card info in and paying for an hour of time with person we've never talked to, mm-hmm. you know, because they've been following for three months and they just yeah. want to have that hour to ask all the questions that they've been having, you know, like never would have thought that when we started this, but now that's like, you know, we're like, mm-hmm. Oh gosh, like that's the thing. We should do more of that. You know, yeah. So yeah. it's yeah. interesting how that's cool. things start happening for you when you just lean into something that feels good. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Actually. Uh, so yeah, that's the reason I said Amazon, like it's, it's really easy, but at the same time, it's hard. Uh, I actually recently got my Amazon account, like my individual one, locked up oh, wow. with my revenue in there. And that's one reason why I went to work for somebody, mm-hmm. um, besides the fact that he's a real nice guy. And, yeah, uh, yeah. It's sales full commission, because uh-huh. that's kind of yeah. how I operate, so I'm really excited about that. But um, in, in trying to fix that situation... Uh, I offered to move this guy mm-hmm. and kind of found out that uh, because of my army experience, I have something to contribute to logistics. Mm. Oh, yeah. And so in moving yeah. him, uh, I've made some decisions that you guys, when you talked about, uh, you hold conversations with the clients at first to make mm-hmm. sure to be a good fit. Yeah. Um, I've set minimums on dollar amounts mm. to make sure and, and there's requirements. So they can't have a fleet. They can't have a bunch of employees. Because if you have a bunch of employees, like, why are you going to hire me to move you? Yeah. Like, you can just rent trucks or get, uh, you mm-hmm. know, a, a 53-footer to show up. You already have the people, mm-hmm. um, you know, and multiple destinations. So that's yeah. another requirement because, like, Route 66 is a pretty big moving company. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, they'll move you multiple destinations. But I got a quote for a single 53 footer from Durham to Baltimore, and it was 30 grand, Mm -hmm. you know? So, well, it's a a large warehouse too. So, um, I definitely set a minimum on the dollar amount because I don't want to move houses, but that's what I thought of when you were like, yeah, we hold a conversation with the client. I think, I think that's something I screwed up on in business early on is I was not niche specific. Mm-hmm. And I, I think I kind of fix that. Now. It's it's one of those things you don't know until you know. Mm-hmm. And I think fortunately, having had an agency where you're kind of like depending on where you're at in it, you're like I want everything, or like you can <laughs> yeah. afford to like not take everything. Yeah. Coming from that, I think it taught us like you know, there's nothing worse than getting paid, but then you know, unless you're like a sleazeball, but <laughs> there's nothing worse than getting paid and feeling like you can't deliver. And when you have an agency and you're working on projects and you like go from this like you go from like sales mode into like execution mode, 
you can find yourself in a place where you're like, I don't know how great I feel about this anymore. <laughs> and so I think that's like a lesson that we were able to pull from that. And, you know, like, hey, if we if this was our first business, I'm sure we would have taken everything under the sun. And, you know, fortunately, we haven't even had a lot of situations where we've had to turn anything away. But I think you just, like, learn that through time. You know, you learn your boundaries and certain things that you want to do and not do. And I think you especially learn, like, sometimes money isn't worth the stress or the anxiety <laughs> yeah, right. or yeah. what it has. But um, yeah. speaking of, like, everything you were just talking about, we had it. So we were we had an office space for our agency uh, last year, and we shared it with a, a guy from the area. But he, like, struck gold, and he had started doing this thing called reverse logistics. And it was hmm. basically, yeah, it was really interesting. And when you said, like, logistics, it had me thinking about it. But um, he basically started out, like, flipping appliances on – uh, Facebook Marketplace, so he, oh, you know, mm-hmm. basically, get, he had this deal where he would get a pallet of like scratch and dent stuff from yeah, like Lowe's yeah, or yeah, one of these yeah, places. Yeah. He would take all of it and like list it on Facebook, flip it, whatever have you. Mm-hmm. Well, turn this thing where like he then started like completely like doing all of the scratch and dent. He would start like reselling all of like the returns and all the scratch and dent to like other stores across the U.S. and this and that. But like turning this huge thing where he's got like these huge like contracts from like. I think maybe like Lowe's or Beepo or someone that has like huge volume on this stuff, mm-hmm. dude's killing it. And it's all just like reverse. It's because like a lot of these big corporations never mapped any way. Like they just have all this scratch and like dent, but then they have no stuff. way. Yeah, yeah they yeah. have no way to then. Exactly. So he has this whole like reverse logistic logistics business now that it, I won't say it's, it's not, you know, how am I trying to say this? It's not easy, but it is simple. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. there's not a lot of things that you need to do, but the things you do need to do, like, they have to be done right. And if you do them wrong, like, there's a lot of ways you can screw up your, you know, <laughs> screw up your cash in that. But, um, yeah, I said it's definitely maybe something to look into. Like, I think it's, like, it's, yeah, it's one of those things that, like, when you figure it out, like, it becomes, like, moment- there's a lot of momentum behind it. You're like, oh, it's like, it's like Amazon. It's like, once you understand how to do it, then the whole world unlocks you because you're like, oh, I could really go about this a few different ways and could pick which ways for you. Um, but, yeah, reverse logistics. I had no idea. Like, so many, like, crazy ways that people make money out there. You're like, yeah. who knew that someone made their entire career selling dead yeah. up appliances? Yeah, like, who knew? Yeah, that's crazy um, but it's crazy being in office space with him and him going from, like, flipping stuff on Facebook Marketplace to then, like, oh, I got to go check out this, like, 40,000 square foot warehouse because I need, I have, like, 200 pallets coming in of this, like, appliance. I'm like, what? <laughs> Were you just, like, flipping some kind of, like, washing machine on, on Facebook, like, a few months ago? So, yeah, it's crazy yeah. that's crazy <laughs> yeah yeah i found i found uh some liquidators that sell that stuff yeah so based off of what you're saying it kind of sounds like uh he might be the guy that's coordinating them to get their stuff yeah i think so yeah something yeah. something to that degree I, I i do know there's basically